opening the book of Kings today. Um, the uh, chapter we're in is chapter 22. And uh, we did start this chapter already. So uh, let me give you a little uh, review of what we're up to. We, um, we're in the midst of the story of Ahav, King Ahav, uh, who wants to fight Ben-Hadad. And uh, I mean, this is... Uh, I must say, quite a quite a story over here. He wants to fight Ben Hadad and get back a certain part of the land. Now, a certain part of yeah, a certain piece of land, the Ramais Gilad. Now, the um, the thing that's going on here is Achav has a brother-in-law who's the king of Judah. His name is Yehoshaphat, very righteous king, and um, being that Yehoshaphat and uh, Achav are relatives, Yehoshaphat comes every so often, seem, seems like, to visit his brother-in-law, Achav. And at this point, he's there, and um, he's visiting his brother, brother-in-law. And his brother-in-law starts telling him about the fact that, you know, I'd like to start a war with Ben Haddad. Now, one of the problems with fighting this war with Ben Haddad is the fact that Achav foolishly made a type of agreement with Ben Haddad that, you know, a peace. You know, they 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 uh, he agreed to let him live. So by doing this war he is backing out on his uh so, some level of his agreement at least according to some commentaries and um and so this is one of the this is one of the issues with what he's doing in addition to the fact that Michayu, the the prophet tells him that you know you're going to die if you go to war now if we take a look at the uh, verses over here, the uh, there's some interesting little uh, hints and tips that you see. Uh, number one, we have uh, the statement of Michayhu that says, Allah v'alei v'hatzlach. Alei, go up and be successful. Alei v'hatzlach. And seemingly he's either saying that, uh, like, oh, I give you, uh, you know, uh, I wish you well. Uh, they're asking Michayu for what Hashem says, and he just says, ah, Allah v'hatzlach. Or he's just joking with them and saying it sarcastically. Oh, yeah, yeah, have success. Oh, oh. you know. Um, but the... What, what you know the background of this is that there were a number of prophets that had all prophesied similarly and Yehoshaphat had said you know that we need to ask Hashem and let's go ask Hashem so the king of Israel Achav gathered 400 prophets and um, Yehoshaphat caught on to the fact that these are not legitimate prophets because they were prophesizing all in the same words. And that's not the norm. The prophet, prophets might all say the same. They definitely would be all saying around, you know, the same idea, but they would not use the same words. And the fact that they're all using the same words, Yehoshaphat caught on that these are false prophets. So Yahshaphat asked the king, he says, isn't there maybe one more that uh, maybe has, you know, the, uh, the is there no longer any prophet of Hashem? Uh, you know, uh, like, I want a real prophet. And uh, the, uh, the, the, the king Achav uh, says, well, there is one, but he doesn't prophesize good for me. And Yahshaphat is very strong. Um, stubborn and he says well you shouldn't speak that way I want I want him to come here before we go to war 
Yai Shafat agreed to go to war with Ahab as long as, you know, the prophet says it's a good thing. Now, um, the, 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 the situation here is really a very interesting situation because Ahav has done tshuva. He had repented. And according to some, this is a very uh, strong, he did a very full repentance, according to some. Like it was a serious repentance. And what's going on now where he speaks negative about the prophet? And he says, um, you know, the prophet doesn't speak good for me. Well, wh 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 like, what are you thinking, uh, Ahav? You know, if you did tshuva, you know, why are you uh, thinking that the uh, negative about the, 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 the prophet when he's speaking the word of Hashem? And um, it, when he spoke negative to Ahav, he actually spoke positive to him as well. But there was one time where he spoke negative to him. And that's what he's referring to, where he's telling him that you should have killed Ben Haddad and you didn't. So uh, because of that one negative uh, prophecy, he thinks that he's claiming or he's uh, his whole mind is uh, um, uh, sold on the fact that he that uh, this Mikhayu prophet is uh, is out to get him. Doesn't seem like a, a real penitent would would think that way now the and, and what is he doing with these 400 prophets that are uh you know basically prophets that are false prophets so that you know these are hints to the fact that maybe his chuva was not a full-fledged uh, chuva Uh, the only way that you could explain, so how do we explain the others' commentaries that say it was a tshuva? He did a, like a, a, a very sincere tshuva. So we have to say that these prophets, they, 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 they really deceived Ahav and made him think that they were genuine. And uh, it sounds surprising, but but that's that's how he uh, you know, that's how he convinced himself. You know, basically uh, convincing himself that these are, you know, the real deal. Uh, the other opinion does it fit a lot smoother. It's a lot easier to say that they were false prophets, and he didn't uh, he didn't uh, repent fully, and he you know, fell back. He had different, you know, maybe he had some repentance feelings, but then he went fell back into his idol worship, and. Um, Anyway, he definitely seems to want to go to war over here. And um, and so they get Michayu to come. And uh, Michayu comes. And again, he said that, he, you know, he, he did that either sarcastic uh, statement or uh, or he was just saying his own, you know, I wish you well, you know, be successful, wish you my success. Now, um the, uh, the, the the king then tells him that I adjure you many times over that you speak to me nothing but the truth in the name of Hashem. So he's sort of like pro making a making him promise that he's gonna uh, only speak the word of Hashem. And uh, now he's so. What does he say? He says, um, "I have seen the all of." Israel scattering to the mountains like sheep that have no shepherd. So what does he mean by that? So what he means is that everyone is going to return, but they won't have the shepherd. You're going to die. But he doesn't say it outright because maybe out of respect for the throne, out of respect for the king, he doesn't say it to him clearly. You are going to die. He just alludes to it. And... Um, you know that there's that uh, you're gonna be um, that you're gonna be um, dying in this war. Now, what is interesting is that he says everyone else will come back in peace, and that's also a topic of discussion in the commentaries. 
what does it mean that everyone else is going to go back in peace? That seems to be a contradiction. Again, if you want to look up this contradiction, I'm, I'm quoting from chapter 22, verse um, 17, the last words in verse 17, chapter 22, where it says, let each man go to his home in peace. And that's one prophecy. But then if you look back in chapter 20, over there, where um, the prophet prophesizes, And um, um, the prophet tells uh, the, uh, the the king tells Ahab that so said Hashem because you sent forth your hand. You sent forth from your hand the man whom I had condemned to destruction. Your life shall be instead of his life, in your people instead of his people. This is chapter 20, verse 20, verse 42. So it sounds like your people are gonna die. The Am We lost them. It's going to take them a minute to figure out that we're not that we're not there to listen to them. He's in Vermont, so maybe he's having trouble with the uh, internet. Right. David, uh, I was thinking maybe you could, uh, you know, tell us some Hasidish stories in the meantime you know while we're waiting i so can continue I, I just continue not... from inside from uh, what mayam loe says please you'd rather hear a chassidish story 
whatever he wants, whatever he wants, just so we're not wasting time because right, you know, he'll want something in the meantime. Man, Lois is fine. So he was saying on uh, he went back to chapter it's in chapter twenty two verse seventeen, and it says uh, let each one return to his house in peace. So the Mayam Lois says that uh, Michaiah, this is this um, prophet Michayahu, he had no choice but to deliver his prophecy. Still, he avoided saying explicitly that Ahav would be killed. Instead, he simply described the vision that he had seen. It was clear to everyone that sheep without a shepherd symbolize okay, you... nation without a king. Can you... can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can anyone hear me? Yes, we're hearing you. I'm hearing you. Hello? Yes. Can you hear? Rabbi Smith, can you hear us? Yes, yes we, can hear, we can hear you, Rabbi. Yeah, but can Rabbi Smith hear me? I don't think so. No, I'm I'm the host now, so you had to go off and go back on again. Rabbi Smith, can you hear me? Yes, oh, yes, there. I can. Okay. okay. It took you, right. it took a couple of minutes to realize that we you were off. You said something about uh, everybody had to be killed, and then you went out. Okay, yeah. So there's a contradiction here. Be between chapter 22, verse 17, where it says everyone will return peacefully, implying only the king is going to die. The word the words in verse 17 is Mikhaihu said then said, I have seen all Israel scattering to the mountains like sheep that have no shepherd, and Hashem saying. They have no masters. Let each man go to his house in peace. And this means that it sounds like people are going to live. But if you go back to chapter 20, verse 42, it says over there that the prophet said to him, this is also Michal, you say, thus said Hashem, because you sent forth from your hand the man whom I had condemned to destruction, which is Ben Hadad, your life shall be instead of his life. That means you're going to die instead of him. And your people instead of his people. That means the Jewish people are going to die instead of Ben Hadad's people. So it sounds like the people of, of, of the Jewish people are going to die. In, in, in here, it's, it implies like they're not going to die. So, we learned uh, one of the commentaries explains in chapter 20, and we learned this when we when we did chapter 20, that it, that was it, there was a story over there where Michoyu asked someone to hit him and wound him. And the person did until blood came out. And so the prophet was wounded. And it says that the uh, the, the meaning behind that was that his punishment his pain his blood will be atoned for the nation so even though officially they were supposed to be killed the people were supposed to die but his being wounded was a means of atonement for the people so that was one interpretation over there because the story was a little surprising why why did hashem tell him that someone you get someone to wound you. That was like the story there in chapter 20. He says, he asked one person to hit him and the guy refused because he's the prophet. And he says, Hashem wants. And he, he says, the person wouldn't refuse. Then then he asked, finally asked another person. And he saw that the first person, a lion came upon him and struck him down. So the second person finally, the second person agreed and did it. And he hit him and he, until he wounded him. And, uh, and the understanding over there, the way we explained it was that the blood of the prophet atoned for the nation and um and Michoyu's suffering it was as if the people uh, suffered and that was uh, basically an atonement for the people now uh the other way of of, of understanding it is that uh, so, so in other words according to that there was a judgment that the people should die but it was sort of annulled it was a uh, hashem took it back. Hashem forgave them, so to speak. Hashem forgave them because he considered the punishment of the prophet to be equal 
to the punishment of um to be uh, uh to be considered as if they got the punishment and so that would be an explanation here of why it says now that they're going to able to go home peacefully um other in, in, uh, other ways of the other way of uh, understanding it is uh, the radak has an interpretation over here that you know one of these applied to other wars in other words we're the, the punishment that the people are going to get applies to a different war. But in this specific war, they're going to go back peacefully. So Ahab is going to die, but the Jewish people are not. In other words, so there will be other wars where that, that decree will take effect. Um, and he says the Jewish people, either none of them died, or um, only a few of them died compared to the uh, when it says here that like they'll go in peace, does it mean no one died? So one way of understanding it is zero. There are no casualties. Verse 17 here in chapter 22. Or another way of interpreting it is that maybe a, a minimal amount of people passed uh, were killed in this war com compared to, in contrast to the uh, uh, to the uh, plishtim, the, the Aram, excuse me, the, the nation called Aram, in, in, in contrast to them, where the the, the Arami, Aramians had many many deaths, and so that's uh, that's another way of um, of understanding this uh, uh, this um, prophecy. Now, uh, uh, after this, so the the real question over here is: so what's Yehoshaphat up to? Yehoshaphat is the king of Judah. So Michayu gave his prophecy. And Achav told Yehoshaphat, you, you see, he prophesizes bad about me? That was uh, Achav's little uh, um, uh, insight. In the mean, in, 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 it stuck, his, stuck some words over there in, in between Michayu's next prophecy. Uh, Michayu then says, therefore, listen to the word of Hashem. Uh, I have seen Hashem sitting on his throne and all the hosts, of, you know, the, the, his, his angel, you know, host of heaven standing by him, the right and the left. Within this, we already saw last last week, um, and uh, um, about the um, uh, Hashem said, so who's going to convince Achav? Who's going to lure Achav to go to this war? And uh, each one had their own ideas, and then finally, the soul of the spirit of of Navois, who was killed by Achav's wife. Uh, and Achav knew about it and didn't care, that soul, that spirit came forward and said, I will lure Achav to go to war. And that's what got all these prophets to falsely prophesy that this is going to be a successful war. Uh, so that's, that, you know, so that's, uh, that's what we were uh, talking about. Uh, so we know that the war is uh, not exactly um, going to be the success that they want it to be and uh, seemingly um Navois, the, the spirit of Navois is is, is going to they're luring is luring Achav into going to this war through um coming in, in to the uh, minds of these false prophets and convincing them that they should tell Achav to go to war so you know that that's this is Michayhu's prophecy now, so basically, Hashem put a spirit of falsehood into the mouths of these false prophets. So Michayu is basically prophesizing that you're not going to win the war, or Achav is going to die. That's more or less what he's prophesizing. Um, now, uh, then we had the story of Tzidkiah. This was another strange part of the story, where Tzidkiah ben Kanana, Tzidkiah approaches Michayu, the prophet, and says, how do you have a prophecy to speak, uh, how did it pass over me? Well, like I'm, I'm more of a prophet than you. And uh, how did, uh, how is it that the spirit of Hashem passed from me to speak to you? You know, I should have known about this. And um, um, and Michayu answers back that you'll see for yourself that Achav, that you're going to be hiding in a room within a room because of your false prophecy. And when when Achav dies, anyway. Um, they end up putting Michayu in prison. And here we have another little hint over here where it says, return him 
to prison. Um, Hashivehu, return him to Amoin, excuse me, return him to the minister of the city, Amoin, uh, Sarhair, and Yoyash, the son of the king, and uh, and tell him to put him into the prison, which implies like he has been in prison before. So this is a little hint to the fact that um, uh, the prophet, you know, it's not the first time he's gone to prison, and basically the kings did not really like the prophets when they spoke negative, so they used to throw them in prison. And Jeremiah, we know about, they wanted to kill Jeremiah, and the intent was to put him in prison in captivity, that he should die there. So, uh, and here they tell him, just give him enough food to live, and minimum amount of food and water, until I return in peace, Achav says. And then, what was the meaning behind that? Again, we're, I'm sharing with you some of the insights, little hints from this chapter, so the the uh, the understanding was Achav is going to come back from the war, and then of course he'll kill him, keep him alive until I you know when I get back I'll celebrate my uh, victory by by executing the prophet. Uh, in the meantime, let him suffer you know, but he'll just have minimum food to just keep him alive. Now, the, um, the, the verses then uh, continue also giving another interesting little hint that um, uh, the, uh, That he says in verse 28, if you surely return in peace. Which uh, seems to be a, a, uh, a singular term. In other words... If you indeed return in peace, then Hashem did not speak through me. Um, just looking for the uh, I, there was there was somewhere else also where it seems to be singular, and um, the commentaries see over there where it's like he's specifically telling Achav, "You are going to die, but not Yehoshaphat." Let me just see one more thing here. Um, Okay, well, we're going to start here. Um, we're going to start on uh, verse uh, 29. Verse 29, chapter 22, verse 29. The king of Israel and Yehoshaphat, the king of Yehuda, then went up to wage war at Ramais Gilad. Now, what was Yehoshaphat thinking? What is the righteous king Yehoshaphat doing not only is he joining this war, but he's bringing his soldiers as well. So he, he heard the prophecy of Michaihu. Achav is obviously delusional or he's uh, in denial, uh, convincing himself that uh, uh, nothing bad is going to happen. He has 400 prophets that said good. So what's one prophet, one Michaihu? You know, so he's delusional. But what is Yahushua thinking? So the, the, the understanding seems to be that since Michoyu did not tell him not to go to war, so this was all meant for Hashem. I'm supposed to go to war. And um, 
whatever prophecy, the negative prophecy was all about Ahav, it's not about me. And so he understood that he is, uh, it's, it's acceptable for him to go to war. Now, or at least he's not in danger, he's not worried, you know, he felt like there's no problem. Uh, another way of un understanding uh, Yahishafat's um, uh, agreement to go to this war is the fact that he had committed already. And since he committed already, he did not feel he was allowed to back out of this commitment. This is an interesting uh, understanding, especially because if this wasn't Hashem's will, then obviously you don't, you, I don't know, the commitment would have much of a uh, claim, except that because it wasn't clear that you know, he's not allowed to go to war. I guess that's why, I guess it goes hand in hand with the other point. Because Hashem didn't clearly tell him, don't go to war, and he made a commitment, so he was obligated to go to this war. So it seems like he just understood this as, listen, Achav is a fool, and he knew that all along. Um, in other words, he's foolishly uh, going to go go forward with this whole thing. So Yahushua understood that, you know, this is what's meant from Hashem, that he's going to get killed, you know. And if Achav can't, uh, uh, can't uh, uh, accept that and, and change his mind, so what am I going to do? I'm not going to go to war. I'll, I'll, still, do my, I'll still go to war and, uh, and uh, Achav will get killed. What can you do? So, uh, so that's what, basically what, what, why Yahushua is joining this. Uh, in other words, he made a commitment and... Um, he made a commitment, and uh, he didn't see clear from Mikhail that he's not supposed to go to war. So he he went forward, went forward to war. Now there is an interesting uh, um, there is an interesting uh, statement um, that the Talmud mentions that Yehoshaphat is going to be is punished because he joined forces with Achav. So on the one hand, you know we do look very positive about Achtos and unity. And uh, here, Yahushaphat showed such love and, and uh, uh, you know, concern for his, for the other Jew, for the Jewish people of, of Israel, you know, for the, uh, the other, uh, the kingdom and for the king. And he agreed to go to war, you know, basically risking his life. Um, but at the same time, it seems that Hashem was not happy with this because he was joining forces with a Russia, with a wicked person. And uh, this is this is uh, not acceptable, um, and uh, it caused Yehoshua to make some mistakes, which we'll soon see uh, as we learn further. Now, so here, verse thirty, verse uh, thirty. The king of Israel. And Yehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went, then went up to wage war at Ramos Gilad. The king of Israel said to Yehoshaphat, I'm sorry, th th 30. The king of Israel uh, said to Yehoshaphat, I will disguise myself when I come to battle, but you wear royal garments. So the king of Israel disguised himself and went out to battle. Now, how do you, what do you think about this? This is very interesting. Uh, uh, Achav says, I'm going to wear, um, I'm going to conceal myself. You can wear your... Uh, your royal garments. I'm going to conceal myself. So Ahab is nervous. Why is he nervous? Ahab is nervous because, you know, obviously the best one to kill is the uh, is the king. And we'll soon see in verse 31 that he actually tells his army that. Don't even um, try to get anyone else. And just get the, the king. We only, you know, get the king, king of Israel himself. Now, so Ahab is... Um, Knows, you know, that they're going to want to kill him. Just one second over here.
Okay, sorry about that. So, um, so here we uh, here we have um, uh, a Yehoshaphat uh, wearing the royal garments of his kingdom, and uh, um, and Achav is uh, is concealing himself now, uh, which which does make a little sense because he's you know because he knows they're going to be after him, but at the same time it definitely is scary for Yehoshaphat. Now, what one of the commentaries here, the Matsudas David says a very interesting thing. He says, um, he says, um, that the uh, The um, the idea over here that Achav was thinking was that I'm a little nervous that Michayu prophesized that uh, Michayu prophesized that you know I'm not going to live so therefore I better protect myself and uh, conceal myself in in from the royal garments because just in case Michayu's uh, prophecy has any truth to it. At least I won't be visibly the king. Now it's, it's quite a, a, a crazy way of thinking, uh, but you, Yehoshaphat, you can wear your royal garments. Now that's uh, that's one way. The other commentaries don't say that. The other commentaries just say that you know they're after me because I'm the one who's fighting the war against them, and they're not after you, Yehoshaphat. You're just joining the war, so you don't have to be as worried as I am. You know. Now, okay, so let's see what happens here. Uh, so, uh, so verse 31 is the king of Aram commanded his 32 chariot commanders. So this is a, these are the, the, you know, the leaders. They're the, 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 uh, the, the, the chariot commander saying, do not wage war with anyone weak or strong, but only with the king of Israel himself. So here we have the foolish king, Ben Hadad, who is um, giving a, uh, uh, giving uh, uh, a uh, command that I don't want you killing anyone. Just kill the king. Very foolish, uh, but that's what he's uh, that's what he's he's claiming. You know, in other words, Hashem put this, uh, so to speak, uh, craziness in his mind. Um, now he didn't have in mind the commentaries all mentioned. He did not have in mind for the mercy to have mercy on the Jewish people. Uh, <laughs> That, that wasn't his intent. But rather that uh, let's not waste our time with the people. And um, we don't want the king to escape. I, I, you know, their, their main thing was we want to get that king. Now, just remember that Akov is the one who gave this guy his life. Akov gave Ben Haddad and let him live. And Ahab is going to die because he let him live. And uh, all they want to do is kill, kill Ahab. What, what did Ahab? Uh, it is interesting that Ahab, they're so angry at Ahab. Uh, uh, you know, Ahab is the one who let this guy live, who let this guy escape. Now, but that's all they want to kill. And um, And uh, so, so, so this is the uh, this is the story of 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 them uh, seemingly seemingly they're making a big mistake here. They just want to kill Achav. All they all they, that's all they they care about. I mean, sounds a little surprising that for a war they're just going to look for this guy. Um, and like after we kill him, then we'll deal with other people. But only try to kill him. So anyway, whatever for whatever reason that that's what they did, and. Um, and then what happens? So it happened that when the chariot commander saw Yehoshaphat, because he, of course, he had the king's royal garment. So when they saw Yehoshaphat, the king of Judah, um, um, they said, this must be the king of Israel. And they went towards him to fight him. Yehoshua cried out. And the commentaries say he cried out and davened to Hashem. And uh, when they heard him davening to Hashem, they said, oh, this is not Achav. Achav worships idols. 
So they said this can't be this can't be Achav. That was one. That's one interpretation. There's other interpretations as well that they um, they uh, they saw that um, only soldiers from Judah came to help him. You know, came to be near him, and um, or when they saw his they heard his voice, they knew this was not. Uh, they knew this was not uh, uh, Achav. Anyway, they realize it's not the guy. So, uh, very surprisingly, they 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 just let him go. <laughs> uh, this uh, they went towards him. By the way, cried out when they when the chariot commanders realized that he was not the king of Israel. They turned away from him. Now, what type of craziness is that? When you have your enemy, he's in he's on the side of their enemy. Why did they kill him? Because their foolish king said, "Only kill the king." And of course, he dove into Hashem, and the miracle, you know, a real miracle happened. But it's uh, definitely sounds surprising that they wouldn't just, you know, while they're at it. Anyway, uh, the commentaries mention, based on uh, Tosefta, the Gemara says that he deserved to be killed because of his uh, a, a lie, uh, 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 because he uh, uh, was uh, connected to the wicked Achav in this war that Hashem did not okay. So th- because of that, he uh, deserved to die, and therefore the the, the neck the, the neck of Yehoshaphat, the uh, the sword was right on Yehoshaphat's neck, and he davened, and it caused the enemy to uh, to, to 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 free him, and to spare him. To the, so anyway, uh, that that's the story with Yehoshaphat uh, almost being killed, and uh, obviously part of the problem with Yehoshaphat was the fact that he was wearing royal garments. Anyway, but uh, what it seems like is that he he must have had such faith in Hashem and in the prophet. And that's why he went forward with these garments. Again, think about this. He's wearing the royal garments of, uh, and he thinks they're not going to kill him. Now, one of the biggest people that they want to kill, in fact, in, in what it turns out is that the only one they want to kill is the king. And what's he doing? Wearing king, kingly garments in such a danger, <laughs> endangering himself. But he basically has, seems that he's completely <clears throat> trusting Hashem and the prophet, a uh, prophecy of Michoyu. Now it's interesting because in the, in the Chumash there is a um, <laughs> there is a statement where uh, Moshe uh, gives the brachas to the Yidden at the end of uh, the, the Zayta Bracha, the, the, the last parsha in the Torah, and he davens about the kings of the cries, Shema Hashem Koil Yehuda, Hashem should listen to the voice of Judah. And this is referring to, Rashi brings it over there, that it refers to Yehoshaphat. That Yehoshaphat is uh, going to, that when he cries out, Hashem should listen to his cry. So it also was Moshe helped out over here as well. Anyway, so that's the, uh, this is the story of Yehoshaphat. And um... Rabbi, which verse are you on where it talks about the, uh, the, the uh, sword was on his neck? So the commentaries mention that the verse doesn't say clearly about the the the, the sword. Uh, um, it happened verse thirty two. It happened that when the chariot commanders saw Yehoshaphat, they said, "This must be the king of Israel," and they went towards him to fight him. Yehoshaphat cried out and cried out again. Refers to he cried out to Hashem and davening, and or according to one opinion, you know, he cried out to his people to to help him and. Uh, um, and um, uh, when the chariot, they realized that they turned away from him. That's thirty-three. So, um, but uh, in the uh, it, it must be a Tosefta or a Gemara about the actual uh, the source of that commentary. Uh, it's it's based on a Gemara some a, a Gemara Yushalmi or a Tosefta that uh, it sounds like the uh, sword of, that was on uh, Moshe Rabbeinu's neck. To kill uh, him. When, right, right, right. When he killed the Egyptian, well, well his neck turned to uh, to to marble. This one, it seems like right. they just left him. They just let him go. Doesn't say that his his neck turned to 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 marble. Hmm. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, the uh, the verse continues. So it, it seems that the reason they let him go ultimately was because they had a command. Oh, no, I shouldn't say ultimately. Ultimately, is because Hashem let him go. Hashem made him uh, uh, be saved. But it seems like because of the the command that they got from their from their king, uh, it sort of confused them to just the oh yeah we got to let this guy go because we're only supposed to kill the king, 
Anyway, so it happened that when the, the um, I'm sorry, verse uh, 30, uh, 34, a man of Aram drew his bow without intent, yet hit the king of Israel between the joints of his armor. The king said to his driver, reverse your hand and take me out of the king. Basically, Ahav now got hit. Some guy from Aram, some uh, one of the soldiers there, uh, uh, or, or well, it, it turns out it's not one of the soldiers, it's the commander. His name was Naaman. Naaman, it doesn't say it here, but the commentaries mentioned that it's Naaman. Naaman was a commander, which we'll learn later in Malachim Base about how he had leprosy. And uh, he and he goes to the prophet to cure <clears> him. <throat> we'll, soon, we'll soon find out about that uh, in uh, Malachim Base, a very interesting story. We learned a little about it, I think, in uh, in uh, the book of in the uh, Talmud class in the in Tainus. But anyway, so the um, the uh, verse over here says that he drew his bow without intent, and yet it hit the king of Israel between the joints of his armor. So uh, what you see here is this very incredible thing. Yehoshaphat, they had in their hands, they had their sword on him, and, and he, he, he they let him go. But uh, Ahav, who they didn't even mean to kill, <laughs> ends up dying. Now, um, the uh, verse that we're up to so so what does it mean here reverse your hand and take me out of the camp where i am ill the commentaries explain over here that what this means is that he didn't want to tell people that he was hit because if he told people that he was hit um uh, what would end up happening was it would the, the the soldiers would lose their courage to fight the war so he told people told his soldiers I, I I feel sick, you know. Yeah, take me out. Everyone, continue fighting. And um, I am ill; like I'm not feeling well. So the war intensified. Verse thirty-five. The war intensified on that day, and the king was propped up in his chariot in the presence of Aram. He died in the evening. The blood of the wound spilling into the bosom of the chariot. So here we have. The uh, there the king is like propped up in his chariot. Why? Because he doesn't want to run away out of the war and scare people. He wants to still be of encouragement to them, even though he's bleeding. Uh, but doesn't matter. He is staying there, and uh, um, uh, the blood is just pouring down into the into the bottom of the chariot, and uh, the call went out in the camp as sun was as the sun was setting. Every man back to his city and his land, and the king had died and was brought to the Shomron, Samaria. And they buried the king in Samaria. Now, the, um, the Gemara tell, tells us that because he endured pain all day in order not to uh, demoralize his army, Hashem rewarded him with a honorable funeral. And uh, verse 38 tells us the driver rinsed out the chariot at the pool of Samaria. The dogs licked up the king's blood and the harlots bathed in it. Now, like the word of Hashem that he had spoken. Now, the word of Hashem is referring to the dogs licking up his blood. So there was blood all over. They rinsed it out near the pool in, in Shomron. And the dogs licked it up. So that was the prophecy. What does it mean the harlots bathed in it? So there's a few interpretations over here. One of them is that the harlots went to the uh, the pool of Shomron. And the blood was poured into that pool. And so the, the harlots bathed in it. More More of a... Uh, way of 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 um, uh, punishing Achav in a way that uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, saying something uh, humiliating uh, Achav by saying that the the harlots bathed in his blood. Um, 
But there's another interpretation here, and that is that Achav, his wife, was very wicked. And Achav seemed to have a, a problem that he uh, couldn't get stimulated. So his wife uh, created uh, in his uh, chariot uh, pictures of harlots in order for, uh, you know, so basically uh, uh, that's what Achav was. So the, the, so the blood of the of the of these harlots, the blood of of Achav was pouring down uh, the on the on the pictures of the harlots that he uh, that he was um, that he uh, would look at and uh, that Izevil had uh, had made for him. Uh, that's another. And the, the other interpretation is that the Zoynites here don't mean harlots; it means the clay Zion, which is the the uh, the war um, the utensils of war the weapons. Uh, that were all they were all bloody they also washed the, those, those weapons as well from the from, you know and uh, the and this is like the word of hashem that he had spoken now uh, the word of hashem was that it would be in the same place where the blood of novel the dogs licked up the blood <clears throat> of novel that novice that's where the blood of um Achav went now the thing is that the blood of novice was really in a place called Yisrael, and this is a place called uh, this is in shomron so the commentaries explain that it must be that the that the water uh, that combined connected somewhere, you know, it like flowed from one river to the other. OK, and then we're up to um, uh, the uh, the rest of the deeds of Achav and all he did and the ivory's ivory house that he built. He was the first to build a house out of ivory. Ivory is considered as precious as gold. And um, it shows shows how wealthy he was. And uh, uh, the, the other kings copied Achav, but Achav was the first to build this house out of ivory. So it says that uh, uh, the rest of the, um, um, the house that he built, all the cities which he built, behold, they record in the book of Chronicles and the kings of Israel. Achav lay with his forefathers and Ahaziah, his son, reigned in his place. Yes, uh, Mordechai. Yes. Uh, um...